Hey everybody, how's it going? Mike here from The Focus Garage. In today's video, we are going to be talking about the Iron Butt Challenge that we did. Now, if you may have followed the channel a couple weeks, a couple months ago, you may have seen that we have been talking about our Iron Butt Challenge that we are going to be doing, and we have completed it. And before we get too far into the video, I wanna say a couple things. One, this will be the first video in a series of multiple videos about the Iron Butt Challenge that we did, and just kind of the thoughts and feedback about it. And two, we did complete that challenge. So, as you may have seen in the past videos, there was a group of us doing it. Um, Ander on his R1, me on my FZ1, and then a couple of our close friends also on uh, various bikes, everything from an MT-10 to a Indian and Harley-Davidson touring bike. But we did complete the challenge successfully. And the challenge that we set out to do was the Saddle Sore 1000. Uh, what that is, is 1000 miles or more in less than 24 hours. So basically, once you do your first fill up and the time starts, you have 24 hours to do a thousand miles. So we were able to do that and we rode from the Northwest Chicago suburbs all the way to the Atlantic Ocean to North Myrtle Beach. And we did that in I think 20 to 22 hours. Um, and Google Maps, you know, before stops said I think it was gonna take 17 or 18 hours. So at adding all the stops in, I think we were stopped maybe two to four hours roughly there. Uh, but that's just kind of how that breaks down. In this video, I do want to take some time and kind of share with you guys what I felt worked what didn't work, and if I could do it all again, what I would improve on or what I would do differently. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. The first thing that I want to touch on is to be prepared for the unexpected. Now, I know it sounds cliche, you know, expect the unexpected and everything like that. But in a situation like this, you need to be able to be prepared for that. I'll give you an example here. We decided to ride or uh, to start our ride at 4 a.m. So we we're going to leave the gas station you know, meet up at four and leave around 4.15, 4.30. And as James with his Honda CB1100 rolled into the gas station with us, he said his check engine light was on and his low oil light is on. And he's never seen that on before ever. So before the trip even starts, we have an oil issue. It ended up being something simple. The wiring to the oil level sensor had gotten pinched and it was pretty easy to kind of uh, re-splice that back together and everything was good. But again, Having the right mindset, you know, if you would have let that discourage you, you could have had a terrible trip right from the start there. So kind of have an open mind, expect anything to happen. Now, timing is the first thing I want to touch on, though. So like I was saying is we wanted to meet at 4 and leave by 4.30. My target kind of reasoning with this is that I wanted to ride a majority through the daytime. Now, I've seen people do these rides kind of in the night where they start late at night and they ride through the night. I wanted to ride through the day. My reason being with that is that we'd kind of start around 4.30 in the morning, get the sunrise, have all the daylight through the day, and then by the time we get to our destination, you know, it's nighttime again. And the reason being is driving on a lot of highways that are kind of new or foreign to us, I didn't want to be in a situation where we would be encountering, you know, animals and deer and wildlife and just stuff like that on a pitch black highway where we don't know where we are. So kind of riding through the daylight stacked the odds in our favor to kind of Make sure we could see where we're going with the entire drive. The only thing to be wary of with that is that if you do this on a weekday like we did, um, you may run into rush hour traffic in the morning and in the afternoon. So just kind of be prepared for that. Um, you know, if you're starting your timing that way there for whatever you may run into there. Now, throughout the ride, the biggest thing that I would say kind of came in handy and came in clutch was my Kyoko throttle lock. Now, as you may have seen in previous videos, I installed kind of one of those bar end uh, throttle lock tools there. And I didn't even really use it as a cruise control or anything like that. That really wasn't the purpose of it. But obviously, once you're on the highway and you're on six gear and you're just kind of cruising along, you know, your left hand, your clutch hand's fine. You don't really need to play with that or anything like that. You just kind of take it off the bar and you're good. But after a while, your right hand, your throttle hand gets sore. So to be able to just kind of like set that throttle lock and just free up my hand for a little bit to be able to do what I want with it and just, you know, relax and take my hand off the bar, my hand off the grip, put it down by my side, whatever, being able to do that by having the throttle lock set for a few seconds at a time was clutch, especially when we were on a highway and you know it was 100 miles or 150 miles on this highway. You know, To be able to just kind of break it up here and there like that was key. Also, on my motorcycle, I have a SW Motec mini crash cage. I bought some eBay, Amazon, cheapy kind of clamp on highway pegs, and man, those were awesome. They came in handy. One of the biggest things with those is that it allowed me to kind of vary up my body position. And where I had the pegs set, I was able to kind of put the uh, tips of my toes on them, the balls of my feet, or even my heels, and just stretch my legs out, almost like a cruiser bike with forward controls there. So it kind of allowed me to vary my body position and take the weight off my lower back and my butt 
in a couple of different ways there. So if you've got a bike with highway pegs or you have some way to put like a crash cage or pegs on it, something to put your feet up on, um, I definitely recommend doing it. I've even seen people use frame sliders before, so that's something that you can look into and possibly do um, and for your situation to see if that could work for you there. Now, due to the variety of motorcycles that we had on this trip, stopping distance wasn't a big issue. Um, some of the touring bikes could do almost 300 miles between stops, but a lot of us had smaller tanks or just less MPGs where the, about the max we could go was about 120 miles between stops with needing to stop for fuel. The beauty of this is, is that you know at around 60 miles an hour, this breaks down to every two hours you're stopping. And the way the Iron Butt uh, Saddle Sore 1000 is designed is that you can do this and you can stop as much as you need to and it's not an issue. This doesn't need to be some kind of cannonball run where you're doing you know 100 miles an hour the whole time. As a matter of fact, if the Iron Butt Association sees that you've covered the 1,000 miles in a somewhat suspect uh, quick time, they can actually disqualify your run and say that, hey, you did this way too fast. So we were stopping about every two hours, 120 miles or so for fuel, and you're able to use this time to get caffeine, whether it's you know a quick coffee drink or an energy drink if you need to, get water, run to the bathroom, take your helmet off, stretch for a few seconds, you know, anything like that just to kind of refresh you there. And in that first the whole beginning and whole pretty much first three quarters of the trip, we the only stops we were doing were fuel stops. So we would stop and there was enough of us to where some of us would kind of go into the bathroom while the other people would fill up and then you'd switch, the other people would go inside, get their drinks, whatever. And it was a pretty good rhythm. And one thing I do strongly recommend is to stay hydrated with this. I read a lot of this online that while you're riding, you'll become dehydrated whether you know it or not. So make sure that you are stopping often enough to drink liquids. You wanna make sure that you're hydrated, uh, be drinking a lot of water, and I know you might say, oh, well then you're gonna to have to pee all the time. It's not a big deal. You're stopping every two hours for fuel anyways, so if you drink a whole bottle of water now, by the time you have to go to the bathroom again, you'll be another stop, you can drink more water and do it all over again. Um, staying hydrated helps kind of keep you focused, it helps you from getting tired and everything like that. So definitely recommend, uh, you know, Plan, you don't need to plan your stops out if you're on a major highway, but don't be afraid to stop and don't be afraid to kind of take your helmet off and get some fresh air if you need to on your stops. Kind of on that topic there also, one of the things I read online that a lot of people said is that the last 100 or so miles suck and they feel like they take forever. And let me tell you, that is 130% true. On this trip, I felt like the last 100 miles took forever. And the funniest thing is, um, you know, those first 900 miles that we did or so, the only stops we made were fuel stops. But in those last 100 miles, I believe that we stopped probably three or four extra times just because highway hypnosis was setting in. At this point, we had been up for almost 24 hours and you're just getting kind of in your own mind and loopy and things like that. So what we were doing is we were stopping whenever somebody would kind of get tired and we would get off the bike and you know take off your helmets, get some fresh air, walk around, do some jumping jacks if you need to. Anything that you've got to do to kind of freshen yourself up and you know get the blood pump in and clear yourself up because the last thing that you want to do is you know crash your motorcycle and hurt yourself or hurt your friends because you fell asleep while you were riding and you were just lost focus or something like that so having the ability to you know have other people with you to just say hey if you're tired stop not a big deal uh we were really taking advantage of that in the last 100 miles there and there are a few times where we stopped speaking of miles Something you'll also learn is everybody's odometer reads a little bit differently. So I learned that my bike actually read the lowest uh, as far as miles go. My particular bike said that we did about 1,010 miles, but the highest reading bikes were closer to almost 1,100 miles. So uh, Google, I think, said it was like 1,057 miles what we did. Um, I've submitted all of my documentation to the Iron Butt Association, so it's not a certified ride yet. I'm waiting to hear back on that. It's been a, oh, a couple weeks now, so I may have to follow up and see what's going on there. Um, but in order to get the ride certified, what you need to do pretty much is have good organization of your fuel receipts. And what you'll need to do is obviously take a picture of the fuel receipt next to your odometer at every stop. That way you can indicate the miles on your bike, the time of the fuel stop, and then proof that you were actually there. On a A to B point like we did, uh, having every fuel receipt isn't as important as if you do a circle trip where you start and end at the same location. Uh, they want you to have all the fuel receipts on something like that to make sure that you're not cutting it short or cutting through the middle or something like that. But on an A to B point trip like ours where you start at one point, you end all the way at the Atlantic Ocean, there's only so many different ways that you can do that. So yeah, I think you only need fuel receipts every like 200 or 300 miles, something like that. But again, we were stopping every 120 miles, so I was getting a fuel receipt every 120 miles. I've actually got the bag right here. You can see we've got a nice little uh, 
stack of fuel receipts in here. I've got my uh, Sharpie marker and a binder clip in here. And what's important about that is it's just good organization. You know, when you take that uh, receipt out of the gas pump there, you're able to write what number of fuel stop it is, take a picture of it with your odometer real quick, throw it in the bag and, you know, toss it in your luggage and you're good to go. Having a quick organized manner to do that really saves some time over the long run. And it also makes submitting your ride certification a little bit easier. So like I was saying, you know, we rode a majority through the day and that was a really nice thing to do because we got to take in a lot of the mountain scenery that was due to some of us before. Uh, we just got to be more alert of our surroundings and it just made the ride seem better. You know, I think again, those last hundred miles started to kind of suck because it was dark out, it was nighttime again. And you know, you're just slap happy. All you want to do is get safely to your destination at the end there. So. I can kind of see the allure of wanting to kind of ride through the night and then get to your destination in the daylight. However, we chose to do, you know, leave early in the morning, ride through the day, and I have no regrets with that whatsoever. Luckily enough, knock on wood, during the actual iron butt portion of our trip, we didn't have any mechanical failures whatsoever. Everybody's bike uh, was pretty much okay. We had a few small snag ups here and there where somebody rode through roadkill, somebody's uh, quick little luggage, uh, the zipper on it. Uh, failed on us so we had to you know engineer some zip ties on the side of the road but mechanically there were no large um, no major failures or anything like that on the iron butt portion now on the other part of the trip we did have some failures uh, we'll talk about that in a future video uh, but in this part of the video I do just kind of want to cover the saddle sore 1000 part there and like I said I am going to get together with some of the other people that we did the saddle sore with I'm going to talk to Ander about it we're going to probably have some other people we'll do a video We'll talk about the trip as a whole. We'll talk about the iron butt portion as a whole. And we'll just kind of get everybody's opinion and thoughts on what they felt worked, uh, kind of what was challenging and what wasn't. But overall, this is just going to kind of wrap up the first video in the series here about the Saddle Sore 1000, just as far as kind of my thoughts and overall feelings on what I felt worked and what didn't work. Um, you know, make sure you're stopping enough, staying well hydrated, being able to vary your body position. Uh, if you have a cruise control, use that. If not, get some kind of throttle lock to use that. Uh, because varying your body position is super important and it's going to help you kind of go the long distance there. The only other thing I wanted to touch on too is that it is possible to do this on any type of motorcycle. If you go to the Iron Butt Association website, you can actually look it up and see what people have done these rides on. And you'll see everything from a 50cc Grom to a Hayabusa. So it really is just a mental state of mind type thing. If you can endure a little bit of discomfort and a little bit of tiredness, and as far as the discomfort goes, be sure to pack some painkillers and be sure that there's food in your stomach and water uh, that you're drinking when you're taking those painkillers. There was Tylenol, Advil, and ibuprofen used on this trip. Um, but as long as you can tolerate some discomfort, you can do this trip. It really isn't so much as what you're riding as it is your mental state. Uh, from what I've read online, you know, people have done these on all types of bikes. And as long as you're in the right state of mind, you can do this. Our trip is even the perfect example of the people that we rode with is that, you know, my bike's more of kind of a sportier bike. Ando rode a super sport. We had more of a retro bike, a naked bike, and then two touring bikes. So we really did have all ends of the spectrum. And believe it or not, you know, some of the people that were on the most comfortable bikes are some of the most uncomfortable people by the end of the Saddle Sore 1000. So, you know, wind buffeting, the weight of the motorcycle, you know, your arms, everything like that. There's so many factors that come into play with this that you really have to consider when doing a long distance ride of this type. You know, I do a lot of those, uh, 300 to 500 mile days in a weekend, you know, just on a Saturday or a Sunday, I'll go out and I'll ride for, you know, leave in the morning, come back at four or five in the afternoon. And I thought, hey, how much worse can this be? And it's really not that much worse. You know, the first 700 or so miles goes by like no big deal, especially when you're just crushing highway miles and your goal is just to get somewhere. But it's just a mental state of mind, kind of think positive, make sure you're stopping enough to stay refreshed. And just make sure, I think doing it in the group actually did work to our favor that there were so many of us we were able to kind of talk to each other through the cardos the whole way. And I feel that helped out as well. But that's going to wrap up this video. Uh, if you do have any thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, drop them in the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, I had a great time doing this. Would I do it again? Probably not. <laughs> this was one of those things where I did it just to say that I did it. And I'm really glad and proud that we were able to do it. Um, it's nothing to brag about. There was an iron butt rally where it's pretty much 10 straight days of saddle sore 1000s. These people do 10 to 12,000 miles over the course of 10 days. Those are the real distance riders out there, but it's cool. We did it. We accomplished it. And it feels good knowing that, um, the perfect kind of trips are usually 
two to 300 mile days, in my opinion, if, especially if you're trying to get some good roads and see some scenery. But yeah, that's going to wrap it up for this video. This is Mike from the Focus Garage, and I will catch you guys in the next video.